Hi, and welcome to Mid-American Gardener. We're glad that you've joined us because we're here to talk about plants, maybe diseases, and all kinds of interesting things to do on the indoor and the outdoor garden. So thank you, and let's see what's gonna happen today because we're really looking forward to it. My name is Diane Noland, and I teach horticulture at the University of Illinois in the crop science department, so I'll handle plant questions like perennials or cut flowers. However, there are three highly intelligent and talented people here today, and let's find out who's here and they'll maybe answer a question or two. Chuck Voigt, let's start with you. Well, hello, Diane. I am Chuck Voigt, and I retired from the Department of Crop Sciences, where I was a vegetable and herb specialist. So mm -hmm. those are the areas where we can, we can find some uh, common ground uh, tonight. Um, I have a, a question. It's about Peppadou peppers, and uh, just a quick. Uh, How do you spell Peppadou? P e p p a d e w. Hmm. Uh, the question's about those. Uh, this person used them for the first time Christmas Day. They are stuffed with a garlic goat cheese, and wow, were they terrific! Uh, spicy and a little sweet at the same time. Now, now I want to grow them. Uh, I currently grow poblano and jalapeno peppers successfully in my garden. They're pretty easy to grow, and I wondered if uh, the pepadus would be similar. Um, do they require different growing conditions? Well, here's what I found out about pepadu peppers, because I hadn't heard about them either. Um, supposedly, uh, a, a single stray plant was found in South Africa that had these small, uh, thick-walled cherry-type uh, peppers on it and a company uh, seized upon that and registered the trademark Pepidou. So if you can find the seeds and if you can grow them, you can't call them Pepidou because that would be trademark infringement. Um, and there's also some uh, question as to whether it's the uniqueness of the peppers themselves or the process by which they're, they're, they're canned and, 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 and sent out and marketed. Um, and kind of like some of the Spice Island trade way back a few centuries ago, uh, they're very tight about, they don't want the seeds to get off where they're growing them, but uh, if you go on the internet, you do see people who have or think they have them and are offering to spread them around to their friends. Mm. So the only thing I would say is uh, call them something else because uh, you don't want to get into a trademark uh, war with somebody who has more money mm. and lawyers and motivation <laughs> and yeah <laughs> pepidou well we have learned something here today oh, and and, and they, sh they should i think it's just a regular it's a capsicum annual and it's the same same as, okay. as the other peppers that they're growing so it, it should grow it, the same the same way start them indoors put them out mm -hmm. in, in you know mid to mid to late may and they see should what happens thing. Yep. okay good thank you chuck very much <clears throat> and now let's go to jim schuster <clears throat> Hi, I'm Jim Schuster. I'm a retired horticulturist and plant pathologist, and I got some emails today asking about this disease, and is Pestula, P-E-S-T-O, I mean, P-E-S-T-A-L-O-T-I-A. -E this is a genus, and it has 50 different species, and it attacks a wide range of plants, but it really loves junipers and arborvitaes in Illinois. And it tends, you see in the picture up here, uh, and then it starts on the edge of the needles, but it will spread into the small twigs and even into larger twigs. And it is known to have killed small junipers and arborvitaes, but on larger ones, it tends to attack and kill only uh, uh, lower limbs on the tree. It likes this weather we're having now. It likes cool, damp weather because it stresses the plants. And this disease, uh, well, actually, it actually comes in three forms. An endophyte, which means it just lives in healthy tissue without causing any problem. It is a pathogen, which means it'll kill live tissue. And it's a saprophyte, which means it eats what something's already dead. And there are some of these species that it, it's all three. It starts as living in the healthy plant without any problem. When the plant goes under stress, it starts killing it. And after it's killed it, it digests it. Uh, anyway, uh, keep an eye on your evergreens, uh, especially the arborvitaes and junipers. And it's mostly on the upright trees that I see it worst. The uh, 
bush junipers are, I have not ever seen it on them, but on the upright junipers and especially on the arbor vitaes, I have seen it a lot at this time of year. And when it's on the branches, you cut the branch off. Uh, if it's on a side twig of the branch, cut the side twig off. If it's on the leaves like this, live with it. Wait till <laughs> it dries out. <laughs> right? so there aren't too many. There aren't, I don't know of any fungicide that works on it. Okay. At, at least it didn't get the chainsaw pruned. Right. <laughs> oh boy, live with it. Okay, words to live by right there, Jim. Thank you. And now let's go to Dr. Tom Voigt. Hi, Diane. I'm Tom Voigt. I work in the Department of Crop Sciences and I work with perennial grasses, turf grasses, ornamental grasses, bioenergy grasses. Uh, while not a grass, I brought, uh, for my show and tell tonight, I brought a uh, weed that we've seen a lot of recently. Oh, yeah. uh, this is henbit. Henbit is a cool season annual weed in the mint family. If you've uh, been out in the country and seen purple fields uh, as you've driven by them, you're seeing uh, henbit in bloom. Um, so as a cool season annual, henbit uh, started to, uh, the seeds germinated last fall or early uh, winter and uh, they uh, started growing again as we got some warmer conditions and moisture and flower and they'll die, these plants will die as days get longer and temperatures warm up. So there's nothing that we really want to do to uh, try to control it right now. Uh, if you wanted to use a pre-emergent herbicide to control this, you'd have had to put it down last uh, end of summer, early in the fall uh, mm -hmm. to control it at that time. So. It's easy to pull. It's, a, it's an annual. It hasn't developed a huge root system, uh, but it, right now it's uh, in bloom and probably making uh, lots of seeds for the oh, future. Yeah. So, so get that's ahead of the tended. seed. By the way, it's in the mint family and one of the interesting, th like ground ivy, uh, ground ivy is a perennial. This is uh, an annual. And one of the interesting things about the mint family is they have square stems. So if, you, if you've got a, uh, a weed that's got square stems, it's uh, very uh, possibly in the mint family. Mm -hmm. uh, Sometimes it gets mixed, misdiagnosed as ground ivy. It, it does. It does, and you you, um, you can see that this one's got the smaller leaves, and it's got the uh, the perfoliate uh, leaves or the leaves joined at the base around the stem. So right, and it doesn't tend to creep and root it every now right. and all those kinds of things. Yeah, ground ivy is uh, probably the weed I uh, get the most calls about, or creeping Charlie. Right, the same thing. it's much so. more pernicious than this yeah. is. This is just has kind it, of a, it's, uh, a probably ephemeral season. Yeah, I haven't seen it flowering, uh, ground ivy flowering yet. This this one. I, I, have. I saw have one. Seen I, saw one. Yeah. I, I, I second that. <laughs> anyway. I've seen uh, okay. a few flowers. It might have been at my house too, so I got to get. <laughs> yeah, I, I saw, saw get my going. first ground ivy yeah. and my first dandelions <laughs> last week. Dandelions, oh, yeah, yes. yeah. great guns. Yeah. Oh boy, yeah. it's exciting. Good. Thank you very much. It's okay. good to because I have had a lot of people <laughs> asking, "What's the purple?" And I don't even let them finish the sentence I say henbit you know yeah. so we've seen a lot of it the purple henbit well say I want to follow up on a question from last week someone talked about a tree a white flowering tree a, a relative in southern Illinois and she called she didn't understand what that person had said she thought it was sophus but we we after the show we thought well maybe that was sorbus and then I have a second one that it might be so we have some pictures of sorbus uh, that is a, it's a deciduous tree, it's called mountain ash, and it will get those uh, common orangey fruits, clustered fruits, so it could have been sorbus. Um, I don't have pictures of the second one, but you can see the, the mountain ash right there. The second plant it could have been, and I want to thank Dee uh, Brunkow because she brought this to my attention, it could be Sephora japonica, and Sephora is S-O-P-H-O-R-A, and that is the pagoda tree or Japanese pagoda tree. Now it's in the pea family, it has draping white, white flowers, could be yellow flowers and it could be violet flowers. But anyway, it can, you know, it can get quite a bit tall. It says zone five, but I think it's probably zone six, which we talked about before the show that zone six is creeping farther north in the Illinois, Indiana, Missouri <laughs> range. So um, I think it's actually zone six. So that's why we don't see it as much here, but we do see it in Southern Illinois. Okay, thank you for everyone for that. And so um, it took a committee to kind of answer that question. And I thank you for that. Well, let's go uh, to our special Did You Know video next. Organisms which cause plant disease increase if you grow the same plant in a single location year after year. 
This can be prevented by rotating plants to other parts of your garden. That is a great idea. I rotate my vegetable garden, definitely. Well, we are gonna go to the phone lines now and Mary Kay has a perennial question on line two. Hi, Mary Kay. Hi, thank you for taking my call. You're welcome. I got a few baskets of flowers for my brother's funeral and they were they have hyacinths and tulips and daffodils and mm -hmm. there's even a hydrangea bush in one. And I wanna be able to keep them and plant them in the yard again. I'm not sure what I can do to do that. I'll handle the bulb question if someone wants to do the hydrangea. You will treat those bulbs as if they are annuals. You'll enjoy them in the house, and then you'll water them until the leaves have yellowed, and that's called ripening. At that time, then you can divide those, and hyacinths and tulips and the bigger daffodils are planted six inches deep by six inch spacing. If you have the smaller headed daffodils, that's a three inch deep by three inch spacing. And you can plant them after they're ripened. You don't have to wait till fall. You can wait till fall, but it just goes dormant. So you plant it, it stays dormant until root initiation and flower bulb initiation in the fall with cold weathers, cold weather. Okay, now let's hydrangea. Does anyone want to answer the hydrangea question? Well, I'll try. Bad boy. Uh, <laughs> first of all, I don't know how big it is, um, yeah. but um, the sooner you can get it planted outside, the better off you will be because it, I'm assuming it's in full leaf because it's in the pot and growing. So um, you're going to have to watch the temperature. You don't want to be putting it out when we're going to have frost or really cold weather because it is in full leaf. But I would plant it out and make sure it's thoroughly watered. Hydrangeas do prefer full sun um, and good drainage. And from there, uh, and you may want to consider mulching it, especially. Uh, just before the hot, dry weather occurs, so it, uh, it's easier to keep it moist. And depending on the size of the plant, figure at least w this year and maybe even next year for establishment uh, with enough root spread out. And when you're taking it out of the pot, check to see if the roots are going around in the circle. Mm -hmm. Because if they are, you either need to pull them apart or take a knife and slice the roots uh, about every three or four inches around and make sure you cut until you got through all the circling roots. Otherwise, the roots will circle and circle and cause a lot of problems later down the road and may even cause the plant to die. So make sure you cut them or spread them in outward and then plant them and make sure that the uh, soil in the pot is equal to the soil on the surrounding ground when you are done planting. Such a good point about the circling roots. Anything yeah. you can rough up the roots. Did you have something to add, well, Chuck? <coughs> The after they've been forced, daffodils come back a lot better than tulips do, just Absolutely. generally speaking. Hyacinths don't do too badly, but I would say in order, daffodils are the best, hyacinths, and then tulips. Can so. I add one more thing? Sure. sure. I have found that the six inch depth works great if you're on sandy or loam soil. It does not work too well on a really heavy clay, and I had yes. a heavy clay, so I always planted them at about four inches. Okay. And that's at the base of the bulb. When they're right, talking about at six the base. Inch, they're not talking <clears throat> about the top of the bulb, right. they're talking the bottom. And most trowels have a six inch blade on them, so that would be if, you, but I have a loamier soil, and if you move to Holland, uh, then you're going to plant <laughs> that eight inches deep because they have a very sandy soil. I don't mean Holland, you know, Michigan, I mean. They grow uh, some there. Yeah, they do because they have sandy <clears throat> soil, if yeah. you have sandy soil. So four, six, or eight inches, depending on the soil. Okay. Very good, thanks for all of those comments. Well, let's go to Donna's question about honeysuckle on line five. Hi, Donna. Hi, thank you for taking my call. Absolutely. How do you kill it out <laughs> so it will never come back? That is a very mm. great question. I'm gonna just look at everyone else over here so I can listen for myself. I'm gonna suggest some Roundup after it's fully leafed out. It may still, and that allow it, and give it a couple of weeks to spread down. If it doesn't want to start showing death in two weeks, respray it. If it is dying, or if you want to try this, you can cut it off about an inch off the ground, everything off, and then you have to get a stump killer. And you paint all those stems and help kill all those shoots. Uh, the biggest problem you're going to have is trying to get all those roots to die because if you leave any of the roots, it's going to want to try and regrow. And so that's addressing a big one. <coughs> I was weeding smaller ones yesterday 
And at this time of the year, don't wait until it's dry and hot, but at this time of the year, they will pull, and we're talking a foot, maybe 18 inches, yeah. single stem things. One, one year to, to maybe yeah, two. Yeah, and we'll that is it, because I, I mean, there. I'm pretty, but I'm not that strong. <laughs> yes, you are, you're pretty. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I mean, <laughs> muscular. <laughs> that too. <laughs> but you <coughs> really have to keep at it. Yeah, I think mm -hmm. I might even go a little bit uh, harder core than uh, okay. round up uh, as uh, 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 looking for maybe uh, something that contains triclopyr or some, uh, um, uh, some uh, other uh, broadleaf herbicide that would be taken up by the foliage and, and uh, would be translocated like Roundup is but, but a little more aggressive mm -hmm. on a broadleaf uh, plant than Roundup would be. Mm -hmm. So there are some brush killers that would contain a, a post-emergence broadleaf herbicide. In and, them, and, so. and the same thing works pretty well for painting the, yeah. you put it around the, the cambium of, yeah. the, of the cutoff stem mm -hmm. and, and that, that yeah. has some effect that you may yeah. have to do it more than once. Yeah. And you can get them all out <coughs> this year and then birds will visit from other people's <laughs> yards <laughs> every other year. And so it's really, a, you have to be vigilant. And while you're yeah. at it, pull the garlic mustard and just, you know, get, yeah, that is bad news. Beautiful rounded foliage and it's really fun to keep out. <laughs> yes? That's interesting. Th I had a question, or a, a comment about garlic mustard. Uh, give it. Okay, this, this person is, has noticed a, a marked decline in garlic mustard populations in her wooded rural uh, far backyard. And uh, it, it, it's, it's, it's gone down and she Googled the topic and found the answer in a report by U of I researchers that garlic mustard populations are likely to decline. I thought that was very interesting since you, you mentioned you mentioned the name. That is very it, interesting. It's, and it, it has only just found you know, the edge of the woods in my place in, 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 up in Kankakee County. We need to find out why it's very likely to decline. We'll, we'll, we'll have to look into that. When we that. get off the air, we'll Google it and see. Okay, <laughs> maybe everyone is pulling them. They're easy to pull. But when they're in flower, do not drop them down back into the woods because every seed will come back up. While they're young and, and, and vigorous, they make pretty decent pesto, I understand. Okay, every, maybe that's why they're likely to decline <laughs> if I people are making pesto. I don't think there's, there's that many pesto addicts, but. Okay, <laughs> I was gonna say, that, you know, I just see them in random places that people don't, they're not aware of what even they are yet. So get on, what is garlic mustard and get rid of it. Okay, now. Let's move along. Let's go to Linda's question on line three about a tree. Hi, Linda. Hi. Um, I have a magnolia that's blooming this spring, a purple one, and it's about well, five years old. I'd say it's about six or seven feet tall, and I've let it grow like a shrub. So it has one main leader and then some others. Now, I live in Strasburg, which is a little house on the prairie, mm -hmm. and we get... We have wind. Wind, 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 and that thing has gotten knocked to the north. Is there a way I can gently pull that upright over a period of time, two, three years, without hurting the root system? I think Jim is going to... Or Tom, do you have... Or Man. Chuck, either one? Well, I had... I had one that was a, a magnolia that that was there was a bigger tree south of it, and so it tended to. <laughs> and I had some success putting in a like a steel post, and and gently pulling it as far and as it felt like it, it cinching it as far as it felt like it was going to go. Uh, the the wire I put a, a section of old uh, garden hose on that so it didn't mm -hmm. bite in. Right. And if if you don't overdo it, you can maybe get it back part way and then the next year maybe tighten it up a little more and and, and, and how well that works will it also depend on how heavy it is the soil or how sandy is it. Right. The lighter the soil the easier it is to pull it back up yes. and the more clay it is the harder, the harder that's going to be. Yeah so I, I w was doing it on sandy loam so. Yeah. yeah. yeah I, w I would try it or I would replace it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because otherwise, I mean, it's, it's, it's going to almost be making a B and B. You'd almost have to dig it in place. And but a five-year tree—that's yeah. that's kind of a. I would guess that it started leaning when it was first planted, and it didn't have the root system. And mm -hmm. one of the things we used to recommend when people put in small evergreens as windbreaks, and they had to worry about them blowing over, we recommended for the first four or five years until they were well established a windbreak 
made out of, say, burlap or fencing that would help slow down the wind so it wouldn't force the plant on an angle until it was well rooted. Mm -hmm. And if you're a little house on the prairie, there are a lot, that's a lot of wind. So mm -hmm. very good description, Linda, of your wind site. But anyway, hope some of those ideas help you. Well, we have another Linda on the line, on line four, and she has a question, follow up, hope, or comment maybe about Pepidou peppers. Hi, Linda. In Tuck's uh, Pepidou peppers, and I wondered if he could, I, I missed a little bit of what he was saying and wondered about the flavor and size of the pepper because I have found um, a pepper that looks similar to what he showed in my burpee catalog and it's called uh, cherry stuffer and I don't know if it's quite the same one or not but they say they have uh, toned down the heat of the cherry bomb and these are two inches they're sweet uh, they produce bushels of uh, peppers on a plant and they're very easy to stuff or grill Hmm. Well, that sounds pretty similar. Um, you know, the people who've trademarked Pepidou would argue that it's, that it's totally different, but I'm not sure that it is. Uh, that, that's, that's basically what it seems to be, is a thick-walled uh, cherry pepper that is not blazingly hot and has some sweetness as well, which sounds like what you're talking about. So that you know, for somebody who doesn't want to infringe on a, on a trademark, they should probably try the, the cherry stuffer and, and, and see how that does for them. But it'd be worth it. I mean, it's available, so. Yeah, and, and, and you're not going to, there's no legal problems exactly. with that. Exactly. You can say, hey, <coughs> I got it right from here. All right, we have a poinsettia question on line six with Kay. Hi there, Kay. Hi. I received as a gift two years ago a poinsettia came from the grocery store. Well, it has set in the same place, and yes, it did drop some leaves, so I just went ahead and removed them. But right now, I am getting the red leaves on there that I thought was only supposed to happen at Christmas time. What do I do? Okay. I guess it's what will I do. So let's follow up on her question, whoever would like to. Well, it only happens at Christmas time if you start shading them in late summer time, and naturally the day length gets to the right length. Anyway, at, at, at some point, but not Christmas time. So it's I don't know, it's Valentine's Day or or St. Patrick's Day, April or, Fool's Day, or <laughs> April Fool's Day. <laughs> even. Uh, but but you know, by the time that natural process takes on, and uh, you know, as the days are lengthening now, I would suspect that they're going to go back to green pretty soon. So you just found a natural time that it was going to produce those red bracts without, but it just didn't have to be Christmas time. Well, see, I would like to go to the mag quiz segment next. We're not going to go to the mag segment quiz next week, <laughs> but I was hoping to because it was about where not to plant your garden. And so I would say where not to plant. Give me some ideas. Not in the a swamp. Not in the swamp. <laughs> vegetable garden, I think. Yeah. Not in the, the shade. Sh the shade. Yeah. And maybe not in clay. It sounds <laughs> poor Jim. I'm looking at him. It sounds or like or you or have a lot. A, like a real, a a real sandy. Not in clay. Like on the top of an old geologic sand dune is not a particularly That's true. wonderful place either. But when we built our house, the clay did get put back on top in the front. And so I just kept mulching and adding organic matter. And finally, it only took a couple yeah. decades, I mean, a, a decade or so. But I ooh. will mention one more thing. Stay away from a walnut tree. Yeah. And that means not under the tree. Take the height of the tree and double it and stay that far out because the root give off a toxic substance that is really bad on tomatoes. So the height of the tree, out, and uh, double it right. for your garden. Which and probably means it's in the neighbor's yard. <laughs> but, <laughs> that's probably At right. least. <laughs> but that's <laughs> what was on that, is not to plant it under trees. So, But we had many things to where not mm -hmm. to plant, unless you're going to plant some shade-loving things. And lettuce will take a little bit of shade, a little bit, some of the but they do like sun, it seems a little bit better. 
Well, boy, this time really goes fast, doesn't it? It seems like um, we had some really great questions. We're happy that you tune in and that you are so faithful. You can go to the uh, website and Facebook and you can add some more questions, but we have trouble keeping up. <laughs> we have quite a few, so uh, you can also look on the website and see about that. Well, I want to thank each one of you for being here. We have lots of expertise, and it's really nice to see weeds, insects, diseases, and lots of fun things about Pepidou peppers. <laughs> and they look a little bit smaller than the ones here on the table, don't they? A lot. So, <laughs> But we've got them red. So thank you so much for watching. We hope that you get out there and have a great time gardening. See you next time. <laughs>